Hello, my name is Ian Aber, and this is Stray People. Uh, this week, our guest is the uh, amazing editor and publisher of Q Magazine and Project Q uh, dot com Atlanta, right? Yep. Uh, Mr. Mike Fleming. Mike, how are you today? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, um, the theme song sounds a little bit like maybe Patti LaBelle. You hear a little Patti LaBelle in there? I can hear that. <laughs> it's making me want to do the, you know, Saturday Night Fever dance. <laughs> Fingers. Nice. Um so how long have you been the editor? You've been working. How long have you worked in gay uh, media? This year will be twenty years. Twenty years. And yeah. where did you tell me? Like, kind of where you began and where, and where okay. you, how you ended up where you are? Yeah, I um, actually went to college for journalism, and uh, in the late '80s, started working for the Daily Paper in Houston, Texas. Okay. After that. Uh, that paper sold to the other daily paper in Houston. Okay, so like merged. Like mm-hmm. A lot of that happened at that time. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, from there, I did some odds and ends and went back to the gay paper in Houston, Okay, which was owned by the people that owned Southern Voice in Atlanta. Okay. So and what was that paper called, by the way? It was the Houston Voice. The Houston Voice. Okay. So when the Houston Voice closed, I uh, was lucky enough to be one of the couple of people who were saved and moved to Atlanta. Okay. So I came to Southern Voice in 2001. 2001. Okay, yeah. awesome. And um, how long, so like, how long were you at Southern Voice? 11 years. 11 years? Mm-hmm. What were the, some of the bigger stories you covered during that time frame? What do you remember? Like, what's the, uh, big, what's the biggest story you guys feel like you covered? Well, you know, news-wise, there were probably some biggies. Yeah. Uh, I was the arts and entertainment editor. Yeah. So, like, I talked to Rosie O'Donnell the night before her ABC interview where she came out. Oh, wow. So then my interview came out two days later yeah. when the paper hit. Wow. Um, that was big to me. We yeah. were, you know, it was a big secret, and yeah. we couldn't let any of it out, in, you know, in advance. <laughs> right. And, uh, it felt big As time. big of a secret as just Rosie O'Donnell <laughs> existing prior to coming out could possibly be. Right, Yeah, right. she didn't read lesbian at all. No. <laughs> This is before, so. This is after she had the show where she would always talk about how hot she thought Tom Cruise was and everything. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. She came out. And what was it like talking to her? What was what was her kind of like? Exactly like you would expect uh, it, with curse words. Okay. So you know, uh, fuck this, fuck that. Yeah, yeah. It's Rosie O'Donnell, but <laughs> fuck this. Yeah. You yeah. know. <laughs> uh, other than that, it was just her. You right. know. And and like you say, I mean, nobody was surprised. Yeah. But she still had to do it, which is the most interesting kind of like... Right. And that's know. changed a lot. Yeah. You know, that was only probably 2002 or three, yeah. And to she, me, that wasn't that long ago, but it yeah. has changed dramatically. Oh, absolutely. Then. Now there's like people who are just gay from the jump and you never, they never have to come out. They're just, that's just who they are the whole time they're, they're a celebrity. Right. Um, not as many as probably necessary, but um, that does seem to happen a lot. So what would you say like, um, so after, after, uh, after Southern Voice, uh, where did you move to? What were you? Uh, about six or eight months before they uh, went bankrupt and closed, yeah. uh, they let me go in a, in a money-saving yeah. move. Um, and I was freelancing. Uh, I did some freelance work for like Atlanta Pride, yeah. promotions work, um, and some social media work for different nonprofits. And uh, Matt Henney started Project Q about six months before I left Southern Voice. Yeah. So six months after that, I joined him, became a partner, and I've been doing that ever since. Nice, nice. And so what are some of the big stories that you guys have covered? Uh, the Eagle Raid has to be the biggest. Oh, absolutely. Um, and in fact, that really didn't even start dying down until maybe seven years later. Yeah, really? And, yeah. Is yeah. it because of all the like the um, litigation or whatever? I, I feel like they wrapped up. Exactly. They finally did wrap it up, but, uh, you know, maybe, uh, and, and even the police force came up with new um, policies on how they were going to handle stuff like that, and then didn't follow through. Oh, yeah. So okay. we had to go back and say, yeah. you agreed to do this, and you didn't, and yeah. you're still, you know, treating gay people poorly. So the whatever. story just kept continuing. Mm-hmm. So for anybody who may not know what the Eagle Raid was, can you kind of, like, just... Give us a yeah. Um, so the Eagles, a leather nightclub in Midtown Atlanta on Ponce Leon Avenue, right across the street from the Krispy Kreme. Just in case you need to find it, right? Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, it may come as a surprise to some listeners that 
Um, gay sex happens in gay bars sometimes. <laughs> Don't and, tell my mother. <laughs> you know, uh, in dark corners, people are getting getting after it. Yeah. And uh, uh, basically, I think it was like a Wednesday night or a Thursday night. Uh, it was a Thursday. Police raided yeah. and uh, discovered people doing stuff and ended up everybody face down on the floor. Yeah. Uh, and ended up arresting eight people. Yeah. Uh, but they kept everybody on the floor for quite a while and like... Talked about them being fags and, you know, did a lot of other things. Yeah, they like degraded the them yeah. verbally, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and everyone sort of made out. For- <laughs> 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 no one's allowed to discuss it, but everyone I know who was there, um, uh, <laughs> you know, um, the city took care of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> At least financially. You know? Right, exactly. The memory remains, but uh, they were compensated to some degree. Absolutely. Um, and when I say some degree, I mean some degree. <laughs> wow. Oh, but yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, that's what's so interesting is that like that. So that story happened, but then like the way it affects people in Atlanta is who do you know? And, you know, I knew a couple of people who were in the room. <laughs> and so to me, it was like this terrible thing happened. And then like, I forget how long it was. And then this amazing thing happened to them. <laughs> it was pretty funny. It was just like such a... um like, not what you'd expect, you know? Right. Especially well, when I first moved to Atlanta. Because Atlanta was very, like, Atlanta was, like, in back in the day, I remember a friend of mine getting mugged, walking home from Backstreet, and I was calling the police, and they wouldn't, they didn't come. Mm. Because it was midtown. They mm. just didn't come to midtown. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, and that's definitely changed. Like, that's not how, that's not the way. Oh, yeah. You know? And even with the Eagle Raid, I will say the city and the police department jumped immediately into defense mode and this shouldn't have happened and how can we make it right and yeah. we value our lgbt citizens um so at least in that way it's well and now, change happened and now we have a, a mayor whose last name is bottom so it's obviously things <laughs> right. have changed times have changed <laughs> Um, I will say uh, uh, I've I met Keisha Lance Bottoms briefly. Um, I was on um, WABE for like to promote Queer History Live. Uh, I was going to be on City Lights with Lois Wright sits, and um, we got bumped uh, because Keisha Lance Bottoms something had happened and she had to, it was something something happened with immigration and so she had a comment. And um, and when the news director came out, they go, "Well, you know, you just got bumped." And I was like, "It's always that way. Always getting bumped for a bottom, you know." Like, <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't know, have any idea what I was talking about, but just I did. At you. Oh, I did. I I said it, and like, I think there was somebody walking through the room who understood what I said, and they I don't even know who that person was, but they just laughed as they <laughs> walked through the room. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's your kind of professional career. Yeah. Um, so you you kind of have a. Um, like you're, are you still mostly arts and entertainment or like, so what's the focus of like your editorial, you have news. I mean, I feel like there's news, there's yeah. interviews, there's. Well, when we decided to take the website into print, which was last November, yeah. um, uh, the magazine definitely still focuses on events and entertainment yeah. and, you know, fun stuff to do and, yeah. and people to know and stuff like that. Um, but uh, we then hired an online news editor. So Patrick Saunders, who was at Georgia Voice, yeah, yeah. Uh, now writes all of our news. Okay. And so you'll find his news online, and then we reprint the best of it in the yeah. magazine okay. the following week. So he's writing, like, you know, cut, like what's happening. In you know, politics yeah, yeah, yeah. or, you know, Which is election. sort of essential. Like, I think that, like, people, I don't know, there's, there's sort of like, you know, there's people who may poo-poo or, or have things to say about Project Q, but... Um, you guys break news that nobody else breaks, or it's yeah. there before it's somewhere else, you know. And especially like in the city, like the news about gay people in our city. So it's not always just you know like um, where's the fun place to go, but it's like who killed this guy? Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and why are you know? I've seen that quite a bit, and, and we honestly, I've always been very thankful for it because it's like I know I'm going to find news about like what's going on. Um, not just entertainment wise, but like what's going on politically and everything else, um, like days before I'm going to see it anywhere else. Though, yeah. Know? And, you know, we have been at it a long time. Matt has been in the news business as long as I have, even yeah. though he's younger than I am. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I truly believe he's the best in the city. Yeah. And we truly believe that Project Q is the best in the city. I think so. And I think that like you guys, I would argue that there's because I've looked at a lot of the sites for other cities, big cities. Um, because like sometimes for, for promotion purposes as a comic, I'm trying to find the, the, the parallel to a project Q and not every city has one, you know? Absolutely. So a lot, a lot of them have the, uh, 
know, it's the website for the newspaper. And so it doesn't necessarily, I don't know. It's like, it's which one's, which one's the, which one's the priority? You right. know, which, which one is where the news goes first. And right. I, would uh, no, actually, but no, I think it's great. And you, did Matt tell you that I saw him, we were on a flight, like from Salt Lake city to somewhere. He did. And he had just been coming back from Palm Springs. Um, from some sort of conference, so living the fabulous gay life. And then <laughs> I was coming back from Boise, Idaho, um, where I did a comedy festival, and he just looked at me. He was like, "Oh, Boise." And I was like, "No, but it was fun. It was fun." You know, like, <laughs> this is so funny. He's like, "Yeah, I was in Palm Springs." So I was like, okay. <laughs> "Yeah, yeah." The uh, the Gay and Lesbian Journalists Association did Palm Springs this year, and he got a a free trip out there. So nice. it's pretty cool. That is yeah. awesome. Um, how do you think like gay media and like gay reporting? Has changed. I mean, like, like obviously, blogging and all that has had a huge impact on how news is reported to gay people. Like, where gay people get more of their news from sites like Project Q and Total Road and Joe My God than they do from like uh, ABC and NBC, which seems to be changing too. Because like NBC has NBC out. Have you ever seen that Facebook? Yeah, page? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what do you think? The what do you think the landscape? How's it changed? I- it, you know, you've you've said a lot of it. Um, when Project Q started in 2008 and nine, it was crazy that we were going to do a blog format. Yeah. Uh, and now it just seems so natural. Everything Absolutely. follows from there. It used to follow what people were doing in print, and now print follows what we're doing yeah, yeah, absolutely. online. Yeah. Uh, and and it's the 24-hour news cycle, you know, yeah. for better or worse, and you got to get your clicks, and those advertisers are depending on it. And, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's a lot more fast paced than it used to be. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you don't really put anything to. Well, you still do a magazine though, so which I've written for. I've written some columns, which have absolutely, been, um, which has been fun for me because it's like sort of outside of what I do stand up. So it's like they're sort of funny, but then they can also have like kind of like more emotional moments and things I really can't get away with. On st- I don't feel like yet. Anyways, yeah, I feel definitely. like the, when I can do longer sets, when I start being able to do hours more. I probably can tell stories like the ones I tell on those. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and I think that's what Q and Project Q have is that we do have that 20 years experience print and online so that, so that when it, uh, when it comes to doing both, we can sort of take, change hats as quickly yeah, as possible. Absolutely. So, okay, I felt like I'd ask you all about your business first. I know. To make you comfortable a little bit, maybe? Thank you. Matt, Mike was um, real worried that he would not sound well or good or something. And uh, I want to make sure that that's not going to be the case. <laughs> so far, you've answered all the questions just fine. So okay, you're, you're good. Doing just great. Um, well, let's talk about you. Let's talk about, uh, so, like, you came out, what, what, what year did you come out? 1983. 1983. Yeah, I was 18 years old. 18 years old where? In Houston, a suburb of Houston. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So coming out at 18 in 1983, that in itself is just a crazy idea. But so like what, when did you know you weren't straight? You know what I'm saying? Like, Like finding out you're gay is one thing, but like figuring out you're not like everybody else there's a little gap, I always feel like. There's a gap between finding out. There was a big gap yeah. for me. Uh, the first time, it was probably still the 60s, which is crazy. But I was yeah. like four years old. Yeah. And uh, uh, I remember, <laughs> this shows you my penchant for milk toast white boys. <laughs> um, and I remember my parents got a Carpenter's album. And I thought Richard Carpenter was the most beautiful thing I had ever laid eyes on. And I was four years old, yeah. you know. And, of course, there was no word for it. I had yeah. no idea what was going yeah. on, you yeah. know. My pants were dancing, you know. Oh, my God. Um, but, you know, uh, so you know, that was a long time, 14 more years till I was 18 and yeah. actually had come out. Yeah. And came, did you come out to your parents? Did you come out to your friends? I came out to my mom who said, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I like how she said it like... <laughs> she Not, was relieved. She's yeah. like, I knew when you were, you know, yeah. two or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so what was it like being out at 18 in 1983? Like, what do you feel like, do you feel like that that, like, making that decision then, like, helped you, hurt you? Um, were there opportunities that were available to you that are not available to you? Um, I don't know. I've been, I've always sort of had the courage of my convictions. Yeah. Um, it, it was early. Yeah. To come out yeah. for most people my age at that time. Well, absolutely. I mean, I would think that that's like kind of, I mean, like to know and to, to have the kind of guts to do it too. You know what I'm saying? It, There's plenty of people who knew 
who waited and yeah. put it off as long as they could. There's a great uh, comic, Akeem Woods, who has a joke about, um, I didn't come out, I got caught. You know what I mean? <laughs> now I'm out. Yeah. Now I'm out, which is like sort of the epitome of so many people's stories. Yeah, well, so, you know, I uh, sort of hung out with a big group of straight, gay, everybody, uh, punks, and uh, uh, outcasts. And, okay. and so, you know, it was just the way in which I was an outcast yeah. to the rest of the world. And we okay. sort of had each other's backs. And so really, you had like a fringe group, basically. Yeah, and yeah. we were convinced that we were the coolest people who ever lived. Well, and I'm sure fuck you were everybody else. And for you that know? year in that area <laughs> and all that, absolutely. It, you know, uh, I, I've sort of grown back into, oh, okay, I'm kind of basic. But it took like decades for me <laughs> to finally realize that I was actually not as cool as I thought I was. Oh, how funny. Um, but yeah, so, you know, in that that way i i had a support group and yeah. network um and I, so but outside of them uh, I, I wasn't about to let anyone tell me that i could or couldn't do anything yeah and, you know like my dad told me unlike my mom my dad said i think you're mistaken when i told him i was gay oh, yeah and it was like nope i'm not <laughs> and you can take it or leave it yeah you know uh if if any if like a workplace or anybody had ever tried to hold it against me it would have been Hell to pay. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't going to take it. Oh, interesting. So you never had that experience where you were Mm -mm. like... You know, I'm sure there were people who stopped talking to me or weren't my friend anymore, but they certainly never said anything to me about it. Interesting. Um, And then, so like, how much time did you spend working just like uh, straight media? You were working or just mainstream Uh, media? A good, good uh, seven to ten years. Yeah. And were there a lot of queer out queer people there, or like? There so were. you were out. How how did that? How did you deal with the closeted folks? Would uh, you would you notice that? Would you have people? I would pretty much like give them their space. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was sort of like that eye contact thing. Yeah. You both know, yeah, and yeah. they're not out, and yeah. that's okay. And yeah. you know, so I just sort was of there say, a lot of you like running into people that you worked with at the bars and. Or did you have those experiences? A fair amount. Because, yeah. like, that's the thing about being out. It's like, what, I, w- I was out, like, in my early 20s, like, 21, mm-hmm. 20. Um, and that's what I noticed the most was how many people were in the closet that would just, I would see them at, like, you know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that isn't your roommate, is it? You right. Know what I mean, a lot of that. Way more than you expect. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and in the South, I think that's one of those things that, like, maybe that was still happening more in the South. Because we're so religious and there's so much of like, you know, could be, you don't want me to want to find out you're gay, you're that way or whatever, you know, could be. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but you were out the whole time. That's so awesome. So you never, you were kind of lucky in the regards then that you never experienced it, any kind of like discrimination in the workplace. Cause that's yeah. seems to be a very common story for folks. Yeah. I, you know, but I guess working in journalism, maybe that's just a, and there really were like gay people all over that newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, from the advertising department, all the classified ad reps were gay guys, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> just whatever. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, I just never really had an experience. And if I had, I probably would have tried to hold it against them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, like, Atlanta is, like, Atlanta's not gay anymore. Atlanta's queer. Atlanta, like, that's changed. That's the biggest change to me. Yeah. And maybe that's the way it has always mm-hmm. been. And it's really more of a focus in our own conversation within our community to mm-hmm. take the focus off of gay men. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe the focus on, was on gay men for so long because of, you know, the health crisis in the eighties, the AIDS crisis made it. So, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but we're much more of a queer city. And how do you think that translates into kind of what you see in project Q and like um, what you're covering even, you feel like you guys are covering a wider base of things. Or? I, I feel like we, the, the city and the media uh, have kind of all caught up to where me and the cool kids were in the 80s. Okay. <laughs> it's like, it's sort of how it always should have been. Yeah. It, you know, everybody's cool to be who they are. Every iteration of queer is good and deserves to be celebrated okay. and recognized. So um, do you feel like that when you kind of came into gay communities, that, and I actually noticed this a lot for me when I came out, was that I had to almost like decide whether I was going to conform. It's like a, another form of conforming, like mm-hmm. to be a gay guy, you got to go to the gym, you got to go to this club, mm-hmm. you got to go to this restaurant. You, you know what I mean? It's like, there's almost like a, a schedule. And those guys still exist, uh, who expect it to be that way. I find it, especially the, you know, the better looking, the gym yeah. rats and yeah. those guys have, have experienced white male privilege. Yeah. 
even though it's gay. And they want to keep it going. And they love but they it. Want to keep it going. It's comfortable, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. But they uh, want to perp- they want to kind of get, like perpetrate that or what is it? Perpetuate the cycle by keeping people like going to the gym, going to these things. Yeah. And it was real big with it was very clear that that was a cycle when the circuit party started. Mm-hmm. Before it was just you were going to these collection of bars and businesses and I really didn't notice it as a kind of like almost like a it's like a negative like reinforcing kind of social circle uh at least for me i yeah. it wasn't the drugs i couldn't keep up with all of it yeah and it's like it, um i don't know how they could afford it it's know? an extension <laughs> of toxic masculinity which pervades all of society which Absolutely. we're all trying to grow out yeah. of um but you know we're getting there it's better it is you know? better i mean it could still be even better it could still um, be even better we, what i find there interesting a, is like when like gay guys, I've had I've had a friend with a, a conversation with a friend where they were like, "I'm you know I'm femme, I, I'm not toxically masculine." I'm like, "Oh no 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 no, you're still embodying." You know what I mean? It's like you're still toxically masculine. You're just putting your like what you think women act like spin on it, which is also right. in itself toxically masculine. Right. Cause it's sort of like a mocking kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like what it is to be a woman is negative in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or to be a woman is to just be like a hateful bitch. And that's not, you know, right. like the best women are really, really strong. They're not just, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, but that's something that gay guys do. And so like toxic masculinity has this really, really hyper masculine look to it. And then like the really femme look to it where it's like, it's, it's the same, it's the same thing. It's it, the, on the exterior looks completely different, but it's the same fuel. It's the same. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's the binary, right? It's yeah. like either very manly or, or unmanly yeah. womanly. Yeah. You know, and and sort of we all really exist on. But a spectrum. like, look at how like, lesbians express butch and femme. Um, to me, it seems healthier. Like it doesn't seem quite so. You know what I mean? Like they're mm-hmm. not. They're, they don't quite hate each other quite as much. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. I always joke about how like if it really came down to it, like all history is just butch versus femmes. Do you know what I mean? Like we think it's like man versus woman. Mm-mm, it's butch versus femme, baby. You know, like, that's kind of great. Cause like men and women are even butch versus feminine, you know, like, oh, yeah. you know, like women not embodying the gender role. You know, I remember my mom having a short haircut and like getting called a dyke. And it's like, I, I don't know. Mm, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that was like, that was an immediate by my father. <laughs> I mean, <you> know, <laughs> um, but that was like an immediate kind of like, you know, Oh, you know, you have the sensible haircut now. I mean, you know, here's another thing to make fun of you about, I guess, or whatever, but right. Right. And to subjugate, you know, those roles. And I don't know. It's interesting stuff and it is changing. Yeah, it, it definitely is changing. I think that like the internet kind of has been a good equalizer in that anyone can have a voice and so, like, for a long time, it was like, you know, um, in order to be a journalist, you had to have gone to journalism school, which means that you had to go to college. And so those conditions were not available to everybody the same exact way. So yeah. now it's like, you know, oh, you can be a blogger, you can have a video channel, you can have whatever, and reach, and then even turn into legitimate, you know, journalism right. at this point. I feel like that that's the case sometimes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so what do you think... Uh, what do you think? So, so much of what we talked about is being how queer has changed. Mm-hmm. How do you think straight has changed since you were in Texas in the eighties mm-hmm. um, in your fringe group coming out at 18? You know what I mean? <laughs> think about what you thought a straight man was then and what, you know what I'm saying? Like, we yeah. talk, cause, cause you know what, that's the thing I feel like part of this podcast is about is that we constantly talk about how we've changed, but have they changed? Has our definition of straight you know what I'm saying? Has yeah. It, has it changed in any capacity? In a way, it's sort of my same answer uh, as how queer has changed. It's finally catching up to the way I always thought it should be anyway. Okay. You know, I, I, gender and sexuality is more fluid than people let on. Yeah. You know, um, and and I think as we get rid of things like toxic masculinity and gender roles, that that straight people maybe can be more comfortable. I'm, I'm sitting here with these straight people. <laughs> I'm looking around the room. Um, straight people can be more comfortable in sort of expressing themselves, however yeah. that comes out. Yeah. You know? So it could be that they are 100% straight, and, and everybody's fine with that, and we always have been. But you could be, um, you'd be straight and male and have male friends, 
and be affectionate to them and nobody call you a fag for it. You be know what a, I mean? Be affectionate is, to them. Have fashion sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, take or, care, use or, hair products, Or you whatever. could be bi and everybody could be cool with that or whatever it is. And I think that that, so, so let me ask you this. Do you think that like, the, like constructs like gay male and lesbian and all that, do you think those are going away? Do you think that the future is, um, is fluid? You know, that is, really beyond my understanding i'm not sure that i know i mean i definitely don't know um, i just blew mike's mind um, <laughs> but you know it wouldn't surprise me i think it might take a hundred years well i but, mean i would think it would take even longer than that yeah like, some people would just hang on to gay mail just because you know it seems fun you know or whatever right, <laughs> right. so many fabulous things come yeah. along with it um but no and that's the thing too it's like the uh even what we attribute as our like greatest things is that that we're fabulous or that we're well organized or that we can cut <laughs> hair or whatever it is. Those are all still just stereotypes that like sometimes are, sometimes they're positive enforcing stereotypes and sometimes they're negative enforcing stereotypes. It's like yeah. so when you meet the gay guy who has no fashion sense, it's like you know um, he wasn't failed in any way. <laughs> right? No, that's true, and I think. You know, I would hope that and hopefully he has a gay friend that can help him. <laughs> no, I mean, I would hope that if you are good at arranging flowers, that you just arrange flowers. Yeah. And that's fine. You don't have to worry about. And it doesn't matter or... if you're doing something with your penis. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I think that there's so many. Um, there's even a show. There's I forget what it's called. American Housewife where the son mm -hmm. is conservative. Um, but he takes ballet because he wants to be able to look like he's progressive to get into the car. You know what I mean? Right. So they're still doing that. They're still doing the kind of like, so now it's like deconstructing those gender roles where it's like, okay, well in this comedy, he's doing this for, uh, to get himself into Harvard. You know what I mean? So he's like the Alex P. Keaton of that generation's Totally. Listener, you know what I mean? That's exactly who that character is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I guess we're going to get, we're getting sort of towards the end. I guess what, what, okay. what other questions that I have for you written? Mike asked for commit, uh, some questions submitted. Because I'm super awkward in person. I asked you all of them. I think I asked all of them. I got them all. All right. Um, but let me ask you about some more stuff about straight people. Like, um, <laughs> do you have, do you have like straight artists and, and straight uh, like PR people coming to your magazine trying to get you to print, you know, like trying to basically get that, that gay audience? Um, editorially, do you know what I'm we saying? We do, um, not as much as you, not as much as we think. Often, yeah. what we'll do is that we'll see a uh, a performer of queer interest is coming to the Fox or yeah. to Laughing Skull or whatever. Yeah. Well, with you at Laughing Skull now, we have sort of an end for that. Yeah. Um, but we will have to go to them and say, you know, they have a huge queer audience. Yeah, and they go, oh, really? Well, you should buy an ad and give me an interview with yeah. them. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I can't think of a good example, but, but, you know, it, we are still chasing them down to some degree. Every yeah. once in a while, somebody will be pretty woke to yeah. the, to the fact and they'll come to us and that's, you know, that's just great for us. Cause then we just say yes and we do it. That's awesome. So, um, I always close with this question. It's my favorite question to ask is, um, what do straight people eat? What do they eat? Yeah. What do straight people eat? Like what's a straight food? What are like... Can you imagine some straight people at a barbecue? Like, what are they eating? Oh, my God. I don't know what those people do. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, Here's to your I recollection. What do straight people eat? Potato salad. Potato salad? <laughs> That's going to be my answer. Okay. I have no idea. All right. Um, and Mike Fleming comes in with potato salad. I don't think anyone said that before. Did I, did I, did I skew your um, answer by saying a barbecue? It could be anywhere. Maybe. Anywhere straight people eat. No, I think they do eat potato salad. salad. It's the mayonnaise based. Yeah, you know, uh, the kind you buy at the um, the Win Dixie. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this has been Straight People. That was Mike Fleming. Uh, tell people where they can find you, Mike. Uh, I am at theqatl dot com. Okay, the Q at the Q A T L dot com. Mike Fleming. My name is Ian Neighbor. This has been Straight People. Thanks.